True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. How did she come into your life as a little girl? I, I very bluntly say that I, she was abandoned to me and I raised her. If I actually told you and you believed it or I could prove it to you, you know what you do? You try to pin a medal on me for taking her. Where'd she come from? You, you really would. I can't tell you that. I wish that I could. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right now, I did her a favor. We would like to have some information from the public indicating that this child has either has been seen out there or is out there somewhere or they may know something about him being assaulted or possibly murdered. That's what our interest is. Well, you know what people say. The reason you won't tell where he is. Yeah, because they think he's dead. That's right. Well, they just have no evidence of that. Michael is not dead. Why won't you tell us where he is? It's none of your damn business where he's at. You don't have a right to love him, care for him, and cherish him because he ain't yours. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. A young woman was found in a ditch and rushed to a hospital in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, in April of 1990. She was the apparent victim of a hit and run. She seemed to be getting better and recovering from her head injury, when her husband, a much older man named Clarence Hughes, paid one last visit to her. She died soon after. Clarence and his then-wife, Tanya Hughes, went by a number of aliases over the years. Clarence was actually a fugitive named Franklin Delano Floyd. It would take years to uncover Tanya's true identity. Floyd would become a suspect in Tanya's death and in the disappearance of Tanya's six-year-old child. The crimes of Franklin Delano Floyd were numerous and obscene. He was a pedophile, a rapist, a kidnapper, and a murderer. His victims were vulnerable, and his abuses were brutal and cruel. Tanya, known also as Sharon Marshall, had first lived as this monster's child, and then as his wife. What stands out as a light in this dark story is the perseverance and eternal hope of this young woman. She was an honor student, a loving mother, and a loyal friend, despite being beaten and exploited for most of her life. Today, in Adopt a Wife, the Victims of Franklin Delano Floyd, we are discussing the lives of his victims, their strength, and their pain. By looking into Floyd's past, we will see his path into darkness, as he chose not to overcome the abuses he endured as a child, but to pass them on to others. This story is as disturbing as it is tragic, but if you can work your way through it with us, I think you will find yourself impressed with the tenacity of the investigators who finally brought him to justice and the resilience of the human spirit. And Dick has brought us a beer to help us get through this. Right, Dick? I have a beer, yes. And I, had, I thought there were many places to choose from because these people moved all over the place. That's true, yeah. But I ultimately decided since... She died in Oklahoma to take an Oklahoma beer. Okay. And that was Christmas Bomb by Prairie Artisan Ales in Tulsa. Now, I've reviewed one of Prairie's other beers, just titled Bomb. Christmas Bomb is their, obviously, seasonal take on this beer. So it's a double or imperial stout. It's a deep brown color with a halo of a head. It's got a coffee aroma, some alcohol, fair amount of spice. Then on the taste, there's coffee, chocolate, and whiskey. Late and lingering on are cinnamon and nutmeg. So it's a fairly spicy beer as compared to Bomb. It's 13% alcohol by volume, but it didn't feel that heavy in my mouth. Okay. Is that a good thing if it's not heavy in your mouth? Maybe. <laughs> you might be tempted to drink a lot of them. Oh, okay. So you don't want to do that. No. And just comparing it like I usually do, it's... It's certainly spicier than the original bomb, uh, as it's supposed to be. And I'm not sure I like all the extra spice, but it's still a great beer. Okay, thanks, Dick. Well, let's open it up and go down to the quiet end. Looks like there's a lot of activity down there. We might have to 
clear it out a little bit before we get started. Well, have you noticed some of our regulars that hang out at the quiet end have kind of quartered off a section of it? Yes. And I hear they call it the director's club. <laughs> okay. So it's like you have to be part of the cognoscenti to be admitted to the director's club or something. You know, they don't just let anyone sit with them. Right. So you have to be somebody. Well, it's one of those things in a small town, right? It is. Yeah. But fortunately, they'd let us sit with them because we're doing this. Yes. That's what I mean. They might have to tone it down a bit so we can record. They will. Okay. Because they're more interested in sitting there and drinking. But let's have a good time with them. Okay. Let's open the beer. Franklin Delano Floyd was born in Barnesville, Georgia in 1943. He was the youngest of five children. His father, named Thomas, worked in a cotton mill, and he liked to drink his homemade moonshine when he got home. It's that's not good. That's rough stuff, you know. Now, is that like, can that be like grain alcohol or wood alcohol, or what is moonshine? Moonshine is just alcohol you distill at home. Yes, but don't sometimes, didn't they used to make it from wood or something well, and it killed it from people? from all sorts of stuff, and you have to be careful about how you make it because yeah. you, you can have adjuncts or additives that aren't real healthy for you. Sure, that's what I was thinking. But in its, in its simplest sense, it's just grain alcohol that's like 400 proof. Ouch. I'm exaggerating, but <laughs> it's uh, potent stuff. So Thomas Floyd was not a great guy. He abused Franklin's mother and the children up to the point where they'd hide under their beds to avoid him. Now, in 1944, when he was 32 years old, Thomas died from kidney and liver failure. Probably that moonshine had a hand in it. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Now, that left his wife, Della, to take care of the five children on her own. She had no money, so Della and the children moved into her mother's small apartment. The apartment was very overcrowded, and this arrangement soon became unbearable. Della's parents asked her to leave, but Della had nowhere to go and no way to support her family. So she's desperate. She contacted the local welfare office. Social workers suggested that she place the children in the Georgia Baptist Children's Home. So this place had strict rules that the children who stayed there had to be orphaned by death or circumstances. So she was forced to surrender her parental rights and the Floyd children were admitted to the Georgia Baptist Children's Home in January 1946. Della told him she loved them, but she had no choice. The home would feed them and clothe them and provide opportunities for a better life. Kind of reminds me of Georgia Tan and the Tennessee Children's Home, where they kind of made the parents disappear if they wanted their kids to get food and health care. Yeah. Well, maybe not exactly like it, but yeah, you had to relinquish your rights. Yeah. It's pretty harsh. So Franklin was only two years old when he was taken from his mother and quarantined from his siblings. He got kept in a room with other toddlers. Children were cared for by mostly husband and wife teams who had no experience in child care. Discipline was harsh and included beatings with a belt. Now these are two and three-year-old kids we're talking about. Yes. Days were structured with breakfast at six, followed by school till noon, peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch, afternoon working in the neighbor's fields, picking fruit and vegetables. During the summer, the kids worked in the fields full time. Now, Della did visit once or twice a year and wrote often to request more visits, but the home always denied her request, telling her that the children were well and happy. So now, just from your perspective as a pediatrician for 35, 40 years, what does that do to a two-year-old to be taken away from his mother and kind of housed like that? Well, you know, the outlook isn't real bright. No, right. right. I mean, I, I don't see how you can grow up to be a really any kind of a functioning adult with an upbringing like that. Yeah. So his, his father, who beat him, has died. His mother can't take care of him. She gives up the kids to this children's home where they're regularly beaten at the home and forced to work like slave labor. Well, so, and like no real bonding, nobody to love them or hold them. No or... one at all. So that must, what does that do? Does that make them like those kids who can't attach? Like when those Russian children were adopted, what did they call that? Well, it's attachment disorder, and that's yeah. probably something similar to what was going on with these kids. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, his siblings were at the same place, but I guess he wasn't allowed to be around them. He was just kept with other toddlers. So it couldn't have been a good place to be. No, it wasn't. No. 
The children were especially troubled, and uh, Franklin in particular. He'd later recall being bullied by some other boys in the home, and he actually said when he was six he was raped with a broom handle by some boys. And then he started getting into trouble for stealing food, fighting, and running away. Throughout the 1950s, the Floyd children left the home one by one, usually when they turned 18. The oldest boy, Billy, joined the Army, and he got married. Now, later on, his wife would say that he had a mean streak like Franklin, but he wasn't as smart. Now, Franklin was the youngest, so, of course, he was the last to leave. He ran away in 1959, broke into a house, and stole some food. The home contacted his sister, Dorothy, and said if she took him in, that he would not be arrested. So Dorothy agreed to take him in. She was living with her husband and two young sons in South Carolina at the time. Franklin was with Dorothy and her family for only a few weeks before her husband said that he had to go. He was taken in by a local domestic relations judge who tried to help him. But five months later, he took off from that house too. He went to search for his mom. Now, unfortunately, he did find his mom in Indianapolis, Indiana, but she was working as a prostitute. So this was probably quite upsetting for him. Well, I would think. Two weeks later, he convinced her to sign papers allowing him to join the Army. He enlisted and served in Missouri and Oklahoma for a few months, but he was thrown out when officials figured out that he wasn't 18 yet. Right, so he returned to Indianapolis, but this time he couldn't find his mother. So he began drifting around the country, finally ended up in Los Angeles. He got arrested in Los Angeles for breaking into a Sears store and attempting to steal a gun. He set off the burglar alarm and the police responded. He shot at the police. They returned fire, shooting him in the abdomen. So do you think he was trying to get arrested? I don't know. It's hard to say, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of senseless to set off the alarm so you know police are coming. Maybe well, he's, maybe he's trying to commit suicide by cop or something. Maybe. Who knows? I mean, he certainly didn't seem to care too much about things. Sorry, he probably didn't care too much about himself either at that point. I'm, I'm sure he didn't. So after he shot, he went to surgery. It was successful. Then he was placed in the youth institution at Preston, California. 1961, he violated his parole by leaving California for a camping trip to Alaska with another person. He had psychiatric testing done when he was arrested this time, and he was released again in 1962. Now in May 1962, he returned to the neighborhood where he'd grown up in the orphanage which is strange because he was miserable there. That June, he went into a bowling alley and he abducted a four-year-old girl. He took her out to the woods nearby and he sexually assaulted her. Now, he was convicted of child molestation and sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison. But that November, Franklin escaped while he was being escorted to an eye doctor appointment. He stole a car and he drove to Macon. In March 1963, he robbed a bank with a pellet pistol and he left there with over $6,000. He was caught the same day for that. He confessed to robbing the bank, but explained that he needed the money in order to appeal his child molestation conviction. <laughs> so what else would you do but, but rob a bank? Yeah, that didn't really gain him much sympathy. No. So he was sent to the Federal Reformatory at Chillicothe, Ohio, for 15 years for bank robbery. Two months later, he tried to escape with two other prisoners. They hotwired a truck and crashed into a fence before being caught. He was given an additional five years and was transferred to the federal penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. So as you can imagine, as a convicted pedophile, he was targeted for abuse in prison. I'm sure he was. Pedophiles aren't really ranked very high in prison hierarchy. No, they're pretty low. He was beaten, raped, and then he ended up getting in trouble for fighting. He was taken to the prison hospital ward for psychiatric evaluation and transferred in 1964 to the Medical Center of Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. Now, he was there for less than a year before he was transferred to the federal penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. To stop the abuse, Franklin was able to become one prisoner's lover, so he was only used sexually by this one guy and protected from others. And also while he was there, he was able to get his GED. He wasn't a stupid guy. No, that's true. But he wasn't a very good criminal. No. Although they keep letting him out. That's the yeah. thing, right? Well, and he keeps getting caught. Yeah, I know. In 1968, he was transferred again, this time to Reedsville State Prison in Reedsville, Georgia. He was too weak to defend himself and made friends with David Dial, 
a career criminal with a large physical presence and a reputation as a badass, so he protected him. Yeah, so he's figured out if, if he's one person's lover, it's one person. He's not going to be raped by several. Right. So Survival skill, I guess. I guess that's some sort of skill. So you can almost feel sorry for him at this point. I mean, I guess once you, once you molest that four-year-old, you don't feel sorry anymore. Yeah, I don't feel sorry for but him But for his all. childhood, I felt sorry for him until he grows up and does these horrible things. I mean, like we said in the introduction, he could have chosen to overcome these abuses, but instead he perpetrated the same abuse on others. Yeah, and it's, it's easy to say that his adult actions were the result of his horrible upbringing. Yeah. Um, but it's not simple as that, is it? No, I guess not. But I can certainly sympathize with a child in that type of upbringing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he was sent to a halfway house in 1972 and was released from there in January 73. He stayed in the Atlanta area and was arrested just weeks after his release for attempted kidnapping. This time he grabbed a woman at a gas station and tried to rape her in her car, but she had fought and escaped. So David Dow was also freed by this time, and he ended up posting a $3,000 bond for Franklin. So he was scheduled to go on trial in June of 1973, but he had jumped bail and was on the run, so he wasn't there. We have no records of what Franklin was doing or where he was between 1973 and when he turned up in Tulsa in 1989. Single mother Sandra Chapman had four children from two different fathers. Her oldest was Suzanne. She was born in 1969. Her father was Sandra's high school sweetheart, Cliff Savakis. In the early 70s, Sandra remarried a man named Dennis Brandenburg, and they had three children, Allison in 1971, Amy in 1972, and Philip in 1974. Sandra and Dennis split up shortly after Philip's birth in 1974. A few months later, she met a new man, Brandon Cleo Williams. After decades of investigating, police would learn that Brandon Cleo Williams was one of the many aliases of Franklin Delano Floyd. Sandra was eager to have a fresh start, and she moved with her children and Brandon to Texas. She and Brandon married, officially making him the stepfather to her four children. But money was tight. Out of desperation, Sandra ended up writing a bad check to buy diapers at the local grocery store. She was arrested, and she was given a 30-day jail sentence. Now, she felt comfortable leaving her children in the care of her new husband, but when she was released, Brandon and the children had vanished. Now, police refused to file a missing persons report. The kids were with their stepfather, who had every right to take the children with him, they said. The fact that she was just out of jail probably didn't gain her any favor with the police either. Yeah, I, I just, I'm kind of puzzled by all this. I mean, yeah. First of all, how come she gets a 30-day jail sentence for one check to, to buy diapers for her kid? I don't know. That's kind of harsh. It is harsh. But if she had no money to post bond or anything, yeah, sometimes you end still, up staying. That's, that's a Mickey Mouse offense. I suppose. I mean, there may have been more to it, but that's the story. Yeah. And, and then the other part of it was... He might be her, the kid's stepfather, but he doesn't have any real claim over them. She's the mother. Why wouldn't they file a report? Because he's a parent, too. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah, maybe but, they weren't taking her very seriously. Well, apparently not. And I, no. I, I think you're right about the fact that she had just gotten released from jail. That didn't help any. Exactly. So the police probably thought the kids were better off with a stepfather. Well, they certainly weren't. Sandra found Allison and Amy, though, in the care of a social services group that was supported by the church. But five-year-old Suzanne and one-year-old Philip would remain missing. Eventually, investigators would learn that Suzanne had been kept by Franklin as his daughter, and he later married her and had her as his wife, and Philip has never been found. After leaving Texas with five-year-old Suzanne Savakis, Floyd returned to Oklahoma City. It's a little confusing, all these names, but of course Brandon was Floyd. We know that, because that was an alias, right? Right. He changed his name then to Trenton Davis and got a job as a maintenance man with the local school system. Then he enrolled Suzanne Savakis, but he was having her go by the name Suzanne Davis in Wilson Elementary School there. So they'd live in Oklahoma City until 1978. 
Suzanne had proved herself to be a bright and friendly little girl, but Floyd's behavior led to allegations of child sexual abuse in the home. A babysitter had reported to police that Floyd was molesting his daughter, and then he and Suzanne fled Oklahoma City, just leaving everything and taking off. They got out of town. Yes, and this is a pattern. It is. Yeah. So they, they stopped briefly in Phoenix, where Suzanne attended Sevilla Primary School, and then they ended up in Louisville, Kentucky. So they're just all over the place. Trenton Davis, who was formerly Franklin Floyd, became Warren Marshall. Suzanne Davis, who was formerly Suzanne Savakis, became Sharon Marshall. So we'll try to keep all these names straight, because they change frequently. They do. So by the early 80s, they were living in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Sharon Marshall excelled in high school, and she had, had ambitions to attend Georgia Tech and become an aerospace engineer. And that wasn't far-fetched. She was very bright. She was. It was just before Thanksgiving break, November 1983, when Warren Marshall and his 15-year-old daughter, Sharon, met with the teacher at Forest Park High School. The Marshalls had requested the meeting after one of Sharon's teachers at Riverdale High School recommended the advanced classes at Forest Park. Sharon was a math genius with a 4.0 grade point average. She had perfect scores in geometry in Riverdale and in her math courses at Baldwin High School. Yeah, so Baldwin was what she attended before Riverdale. Yes, yeah, she attended a lot of schools. She, yeah, because they moved a lot. Yeah, and maintained good grades despite all that. Yeah. Warren did all the talking for her in this meeting, though. He told the teacher that Sharon's mother had died when Sharon was young, and he was doing the best he could as a single dad, trying to garner sympathy. Sharon's academic performance at Riverdale was impressive, and Sharon was accepted for the transfer. The thing was that nothing was mentioned about the fact that Sharon was transferring to her fourth high school that year. So I don't yeah. know why no one caught up with that no or one, questioned that. No one picked that up. No. And you're going to see throughout this story that things could have been picked up and they weren't. Oh, and also, sure. she could have told people and asked for help, but in that situation, she didn't. Nope. As a teenager, Sharon had long, wavy blonde hair and big blue eyes. Her personality drew people to her. She was very well-liked. She was a voracious reader. But around her dad, Sharon was different. She became quiet and withdrawn. Warren dominated her, and his personality could be very overbearing and actually obnoxious. Life with Warren had shaped Sharon, though, and she was completely obedient to him. And now Jennifer Fisher was a young lady who grew up in Stone Mountain, Georgia, which is about 20 miles northeast of Atlanta. She grew up with her parents, Sue and Joel. Joel was an airline pilot, and Sue was a stay-at-home mom. But Jennifer met Sharon at a leadership conference at Berry College in the summer of 1984. Jennifer had been chosen to attend the camp in preparation for her duties as newly elected member of the student council. And even though Sharon had only been at Forest Park for a few months, she had been elected into the student council and therefore getting the uh, admission to the leadership conference. So Jennifer's only ambition was to get through high school. But Sharon was different. She was an overachiever who had plans for college and a career. So though they were very different in their home lives and ambitions, the two girls formed a tight bond. When the week was over and it was time to go home, they hugged each other and cried. Now Jennifer asked Sharon for her phone number, and this is an interesting point here. Yeah. Sharon paused and said she wasn't allowed to give out her phone number. So Jennifer gave Sharon her number and told her to call, and Sharon agreed. So that's, that's kind of odd, right? Isn't it? Yeah. I'm not allowed to give my phone number out? Right. So a week goes by after, after the conference had ended, and Jennifer was fairly disappointed. Very that, disappointed, I'd say. That she hadn't heard from Sharon. Yeah. She had told her parents all about Sharon and how they had hit it off, and she had expected to hear from her new friend within a day or two. So she started to think that something was wrong. Maybe Sharon had lost her number. So Jennifer went through the student council camp directory, where the students' names and numbers were listed, and she was happy to find Sharon's number, and dialed her up immediately. So I think she was expecting, you know, a happy reunion on the phone. She was, but it didn't happen that way. Sharon answered after a couple rings. Jennifer was excited, but Sharon sounded unhappy. She seemed nervous and not at all like the girl she'd met at camp. You weren't supposed to call, Sharon said, and then Jennifer heard a man yelling in the background. 
Sharon was apologizing to the man and crying. Then Jennifer heard loud footsteps, and the phone was hung up with a crash. Yeah, so this startled Jennifer, who had, you know, kind of the perfect upbringing, it sounds like. But yeah, five minutes... she hadn't been exposed to scenes like this, had she? No. But five minutes later, Sharon called back, and she was calmer and apologized for hanging up. She said that her dad had been upset, but she was glad to hear from Jennifer. So soon the girls forgot about the incident, and they chatted about the usual stuff, school and boys and movies, and they agreed to talk again the next day. When Jennifer called the next day, Warren Marshall answered the phone, and he sounded really nice and polite, and he invited her to come over and spend the night at their house. After a month or so of talking nearly every day, Jennifer got permission to invite Sharon over for a sleepover. She came over on a Saturday afternoon. Warren drove her there, and he wanted to meet Jennifer's parents. So the Fishers had a large, beautiful house. They were fairly well off. And Sharon couldn't believe her friend lived in this palace as it was to her. Warren had a thin mustache, the top of his head was balding, and he had a little bit of dark hair above his ears. He was wearing some cheap sneakers and jeans and a St. Louis Cardinals t-shirt. Jennifer and Sharon hugged, thrilled to see each other, and Warren came in kind of like the slimy salesperson, shaking Joel Fisher's hand. When Warren complimented the Fishers on their home, he promptly told them that he was a house painter. He said he wouldn't mind painting some of the houses in their neighborhood. A guy like me could do well around here, he said, and he gave Joel one of his business cards. If you know anyone looking for a painter, I'm your man, he added, so he's a little bit pushy about it. Now Joel took the card and Warren left. He left Sharon to hang out with Jennifer overnight, but he returned the next morning, and the Fishers were very impressed with Sharon. She was bubbly, and she was a good student, very interested in her education. They were hoping that some of her ambition would rub off onto their daughter, Jennifer, who really wasn't into school. When Warren picked up Sharon the next morning, he asked Joel if he'd had a chance to find him any painting jobs yet. Yeah. So that was kind of, like, crazy. Very. I mean, you just met this guy the afternoon before. Right. Have you found me any work yet? Right. And he told him all about how he had hurt his back and he was having financial troubles. Yeah. I mean, we've all met people kind of like this, maybe not to this extreme, but we've all met people kind of like this. Oh, we have. Yeah. Two weeks later, Sharon came to stay with Jennifer again. And Warren asked to speak to Jennifer's father and proceeded to ask him for a loan. Joel turned him down, which isn't a surprise, and Warren actually pleaded, but Joel said no. Now, Warren wasn't likable, but he seemed to be making an effort to be friendly, and they were very fond of Sharon, so they decided to just give him a pass because he was a single dad and he was raising a wonderful daughter, so they decided they would tolerate him, even though he was kind of obnoxious that he was. So Sharon was continuing to invite Jennifer to her house, but Jennifer's parents were resistant to this idea because they just weren't too sure about Warren. Yeah. There was something odd about him. But one night while Jennifer's father was away for several days piloting. Yeah, he was a pilot for one of the airlines. Right. Sue Fisher relented and drove Jennifer to Sharon's for an overnight. So she turns onto the Marshall Street and she's very unimpressed. Yeah. It's a pretty run-down neighborhood with trash and toys and bikes scattered around the lawns. Marshalls lived in the last house on the right, which was the one with the most weeds overgrown around it. Now I can kind of see how she's feeling, but you don't want to judge people by money or possessions. No. No, but I could see how she'd be kind of skeptical of this guy. Yes, I mean, they, they don't like him that much anyway. Right. And mom gets to the neighborhood and says, boy, this looks like a piece of shit. But what are you going to say to your daughter? You can't spend the night because they're poor? No, you can't do that. I'm not going to do that. So they pull into the driveway, and Sharon comes running out of the house. Jennifer jumped out of the car. They're hugging each other. Warren came out of the house, and Sue stayed in her car. Yeah. And she left pretty quickly. She was kind of cowardly here, I think. I think she probably should have gone inside, and something could have happened to her daughter there. Which it kind of did. Well, it kind of did. Jennifer was led into the house by Sharon. Her mom left. Sharon pointed out a worn framed photo and said, That's my mom. So the woman in the photo had dark hair, but her face was kind of blurry. It's just kind of an old snapshot. But Jennifer, you know, she's a nice girl. She tells her that her mother was beautiful. There was a small little kitchen, 
off the living room and a short hallway that led to Warren's room, Jennifer looked inside and saw rows of black videotapes lined up against one wall. I just shuddered to think what was on those. And when they walked by, he pulled a curtain across his doorway. Now Sharon's bedroom didn't have a door either, just a flimsy curtain hanging in the door. And there was one room that did have an actual door next to Warren's room. Sharon told Jennifer no one was allowed in that room. That's creepy. And Jennifer didn't ask why. But she why. didn't ask why. No, I mean, she's a teenage girl. What's she going to do? Yeah. The girls were in Sharon's room when Warren came in, and he said he's taking them out to dinner. So he took them out to dinner, and that seemed fairly normal. After dinner, he said he was taking them out dancing. So Jennifer's only 14, and she's all excited. She's never been to a dance club before. So she's got all these ideas of, like, Saturday Night Fever or something, right? Yeah, her poor little mind is about to be blown. Yeah. So Sharon and Jennifer go through Sharon's dresser drawers to find something to wear dancing. Jennifer's excited, and she doesn't really notice that the drawers are filled with some really raunchy lingerie, including crotchless panties and G-strings in Sharon's drawers. Sharon grabbed some mini dresses and held them up for her father to approve. And after they dressed and put on makeup, he complimented them, and he dropped them off at a raunchy bar. Now, I walked them in the door, and for some reason the bouncer let them in, and then he turned around and left them there and said, I'll be back later to pick you up. And this must have been something he'd done with Sharon before because she didn't seem phased at all. But Jennifer was like, what the hell's going on here? No kidding. She didn't know what to do. But then I guess Sharon just began dancing on this tiny dance floor. And she waved Jennifer over and they ended up dancing together all evening. There were some old sleazy looking men noticing them. But Sharon didn't seem phased by it. She just confidently waved them away. And at midnight, Warren returned and picked them up and took them home. Yeah. So, quite a night. So it was quite a night. Fortunately, <laughs> nothing happened to the girls. Yeah. Well, it seemed like Sharon had already kind of learned how to take care of herself. So once the girls were back in Sharon's room, they started giggling and making fun of the creepy guys they had seen at the bar. And Jennifer was laughing and changing into her nightgown when Warren stormed into the room screaming with a gun in his hand. Wow. So that's that's a... Surprise. That'd to be put scary, it huh? Terrifying. Sharon's trembling. Jennifer starts to cry. But then Warren left the room as suddenly as he had entered. And the next morning, he acted as if nothing unusual had happened. Yeah, and I guess Sharon just kind of made excuses for him. Yeah, you know, oh, that's just dead. Yeah, I know. It's terrible. A few months later, another really strange thing happened with Warren Marshall. The Fisher family returned home from a shopping trip on a Saturday afternoon and they found Warren stretched out on their sofa like he'd been sleeping there. Sharon was sitting in a chair beside him, and she was crying, looking nervous and embarrassed. Warren told Joel Fisher that they had come to visit, and the garage door was unlocked. So Jennifer and Sharon went upstairs. Warren told Joel he had a bad back, and the damn doctors wouldn't help him. Joel and Sue Fisher knew that they had locked all their doors, and they didn't know how Warren had gotten into their house, so that was disturbing. But for Sharon's sake, and maybe a little bit out of fear, Joel just kept his cool. That was probably a good idea. After Warren left, they checked the entire house, and surprisingly nothing was missing. But at this point, they knew that Warren just wasn't right, and they needed to keep an eye on him. Yeah, something's not quite there with him. And Jennifer wasn't allowed to go back to their house. Right. So Sharon took her SATs in June of 85, scoring well above average. So along with her grades and her participation in extracurricular activities, she seemed pretty set to go to college, and Georgia Tech was her goal. So that same year, Sharon also got a boyfriend. His name was Jason Anderson, and he was a junior at Forest Park High School. He was tall, blonde, good-looking guy, and he happened to play on a football team. So now that she had a boyfriend, Sharon spent less time with Jennifer, but the girls still talked a couple of times each week. So Warren would accompany Sharon and Jason on most of their dates, and Jason was okay with this at first. Sharon told him that her father was a lonely widower, and she felt bad leaving him at home. But people thought it was strange. Yeah? I think so. Well, she went to the prom with Jason, and fortunately, Warren stayed home that night. In March 1986, Sharon called Jennifer, and she was all excited. She told her she'd been accepted at Georgia Tech. She was awarded a full scholarship, by this time, she and Jason had broken up. Sharon had big plans to live in Atlanta, attend Georgia Tech, 
and eventually work for NASA. So she's doing great. Considering all she's been through, she's an amazing person. Absolutely. But Sharon hadn't told Warren yet, and she told Jennifer she was afraid he wouldn't let her go. But she was surprised to see that Warren said she could go. So by all appearances, he was supporting her plans. But then towards the end of the school year, Sharon began gaining weight, especially around her midsection, and teachers began to think she was probably pregnant. But Sharon denied it. By May, it was obvious, though. Sharon was called into the guidance office, and she burst into tears and admitted that she was due in July. Sharon told the guidance counselor that the father of the baby was her new boyfriend, and this guy's name was Curtis Flournoy. But she was devastated. Curtis was angry with her, and he wanted her to give up college and have the baby with him. So Sharon ended up not attending the graduation ceremony. Her father said that she would be an embarrassment doing it pregnant, and she ended up running away with Curtis. But that didn't last long because Warren caught up with them in a motel. They were on their way to Alabama. Warren acted very calm, and he told Sharon and Curtis that they could just get a good night's sleep and talk everything over in the morning. But in the morning, Warren and Sharon were gone, and Curtis found a note under his door saying that the baby's father was not him and warning him that he needed to leave Sharon alone. The motel desk clerk told him that they'd left in the middle of the night. Now Jennifer got a call from Sharon that June, and Sharon told her she was pregnant. She was moving to Arizona with her father. The climate would be better for his arthritis and his asthma, she said. And then she still had plans to go to college. She was going to attend Arizona State after she had her baby. So she hasn't given up completely on her future. Not yet. But she's given up a great thing, a scholarship to Georgia Tech. I guess. It's a big deal. So mid-July, Jennifer got another letter from Sharon, and this one was postmarked from Mesa, Arizona. Sharon had had a baby boy. She wrote about the long labor and all the details about her son. She told Jennifer that a wealthy family had adopted him. Warren had found this couple. They were two doctors who lived in a mansion in Texas. Sharon wrote that it was hard to give him up, but she felt good that he was going to have a good life. Then two weeks later, Sharon visited Jennifer. She had taken a Greyhound bus across the country. Now Sharon seemed like her happy, bubbly self again. She and Jennifer went to the mall and to the beach. They spent time with Jennifer's mother, Sue, but when Sharon asked if she could stay and live with them, Sue said she would have to have her father's permission. Now Sharon said it was her decision and begged Sue to let her stay, but Sue said no. Sue asked if there were reasons why she didn't want to stay with her father, but Sharon just shook her head. After that, Sharon seemed sad. She took back her request and said she really needed to get back to her father. So Joel got a plane ticket for her and took her to the airport. So it seems like to me they really missed out on some signs there where they could have intervened. It does. I don't want to be hard on these people, but I mean, if this girl, she's what, 16 or she's at least 17, right? She's not young. She's old enough that she should be able to decide to live with them, I would think. Yeah. So I really think that they missed the boat there. They could have probably helped her at that point. But I'm sure they feel guilty anyway about it. After not hearing from Sharon for months, Jennifer was surprised when she got a phone call from her in the fall of 1986. Sharon told Jennifer she was in South Carolina with her dad, but she sounded really strange and distressed. This wasn't the fun-loving Sharon that Jennifer knew. This was the stressed, worried Sharon that she'd seen before when her father was angry with her. During this phone call, Sharon was begging Jennifer to come up and see her in South Carolina. Now, while this was happening, Jennifer was still a high school student, so it's not like she could just decide to go to South Carolina on her own. She thought about asking her dad, Joel, but realized that that would be ridiculous. There's no way he'd let her. He'd never go for that. So Sharon kept half-heartedly pleading with her to come visit, but Jennifer declined. And that's when an angry male voice came on the phone, and it was Warren, of course. He aggressively asked Jennifer, what kind of friend are you? Jennifer decided to hang up on the two, and it was a disturbing and odd situation. She felt kind of frightened when she hung up, and frightened for her friend as well. Yeah. Well, and it, it might have been a good thing that she turned down the invitation. Oh, absolutely. You know, I wonder what, what he was happened. planning on doing. Right. Probably going to steal her. Because the, the sense is that Sharon was inviting Jennifer because Warren wanted her to. I believe so, yes. Right? Mm-hmm. So a few weeks later, Sharon wrote a 
letter to Jennifer where she apologized for that phone call, and then she also told Jennifer that she and Warren were moving to Florida. Jennifer got a congratulations card in the mail from Sharon the following spring in 1987. She congratulated her for all her hard work in school. Jennifer had been taking her academics more seriously, and she'd become a good student. And much of this, of course, was due to the encouragement and example of Sharon. Her GPA rose significantly that year, and she ended up attending college. Over the next several months, Jennifer learned that Sharon was working at a bar in Tampa. But Sharon made it sound kind of glamorous. She bragged about meeting all kinds of rock stars who visited the club, such as the band members of Van Halen. But Jennifer was shocked when Sharon told her about getting breast implants. It just seemed really unlike her to do that. Yeah, and she's, what, 17, 18 years old? Yeah, maybe 19 at that point. Young. Very. But, you know, if you're a stripper, I think you get more money that way. Right. Yeah, so that must have been Warren's idea. The communication between the two friends continued to become less frequent. They were once just like sisters sharing everything, but after returning to her father in Phoenix, Sharon had become estranged. They made Jennifer sad that she couldn't share the important aspects of her life with Sharon, who she considered her very best friend. On one of their final calls in late 1987, Jennifer was really surprised to hear that Sharon had given birth to a baby boy named Michael. He was six months old already, which meant that she'd been holding back on the information without telling Jennifer. She was happy for Sharon a little bit, but at the same time, it hurt to have such a big part of her life kept from her. It seemed like they were becoming estranged. In 1992, Jennifer was getting married, and she wanted Sharon to be her maid of honor, but she had no way of getting in touch with her. She had no idea where she was, and she wouldn't know what became of her friend until 1994, when she would receive a phone call from her mother, Sue, and she'd learned that her friend, Sharon Marshall, was dead. Right, so Sharon had become Tanya Hughes back in 1989. Now, under this name, she started working as an exotic dancer at Passions Club in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. She was an attractive, passionate dancer who had danced at a club in Tampa. She was very pretty, but her body was oddly shaped from badly performed plastic surgeries. Her breasts were unusually large and hard. Is that just poor technique or poor materials or what? Um, I think it's poor technique, and it's also just overdoing it. Yeah, so you're trying Which, to get you know, too I worked big for a, a plastic surgeon for a while, and I did have some strippers come in for breast implants. And they always wanted huge ones? Yeah, it looked ridiculous. Also, I think back then they would sometimes put the implants outside of the muscles, so they would kind of be in odd positions. Yeah. So I don't know if the material would have been cheap, but they were cheap plastic surgeries from what I've heard. Because, of course, Warren didn't have a lot of money. He probably tried to get it done wherever and probably not the best surgeon in the world. So I think they were just basically too big was one of the main things. Yeah, Yeah. too big for her body. Yeah, definitely. So Tanya lived in a rundown trailer park in Tulsa with her husband Clarence and their two-year-old son Michael. She worked seven days a week, and she had gathered a small following of fans. She performed as a young teenager wearing a low-cut sweater, pleated miniskirt, bobby socks, and high-heeled shoes. And her song that she usually danced to was Locomotion, great 60s song. Yeah, come on, baby, do, do the, locomotion. the locomotion. Natanya wasn't a drinker, though, and she avoided the drug scene. Unlike the other dancers, she liked to read. So it's kind of funny. She usually brought in a book to read between her dance sets. I'm sure that wasn't the usual. Sometimes she even crocheted. She told her friend Connie, who was also a dancer, that reading and crocheting calmed her ailing stomach because she was always popping Rolaids into her mouth. So, I mean, that was a stressful life she was leading. Maybe she had ulcers. Oh, she could have. I'm sure she had an a irritable stomach. I know, right? A lot of stress. Everyone at Passions knew that Tanya's core problem was her husband Clarence, who we know was Floyd. He was twice her age with gray hair that hung over his neck. No one understood what had attracted her to him, but he was definitely obsessed with her. He controlled everything she did. He drove her to work most days and picked her up late at night. And the other dancers thought he was super creepy. He would often call the club to check up on her. 
but maybe the most disturbing part was how he demanded that she bring home at least $200 a night, or there was hell to pay. And Tanya obeyed her husband. She worked hard, and if she fell short of that $200, they could see her become nervous, almost frantic. Clarence would be waiting in the parking lot, and she would hand over every dollar she earned. Sometimes she came back to work the next day with new bruises. That was not uncommon. So even though her co-workers have rough lives themselves probably, right? Yes. Yeah, they felt sorry for her. Some of them tried to convince her to leave her husband, but she was clearly afraid of him. She said she'd tried to leave him before, and he said if she ever tried again, he would kill her. And she believed him. Clarence had friends in the local police department, too, so that made her feel like she and her little son had no place to go for help. Now, while working, Tanya met Kevin Brown. He was a college student, and he was a customer at the club. He stayed after, and he bought her a soda. He learned that Tanya was married and very unhappy. Now, she dated Kevin, sneaking out of the club for dinners, while Clarence was in the parking lot waiting for her. And as things got more serious, Kevin said he would take her and her son away out of state to save them from Clarence. Now, she declined, saying that he had guns and... He had connections in the police department. If she left, he would definitely kill Kevin and her and probably little Michael, too. Yeah, but eventually she decided she would leave. Finally got to a point where she just couldn't handle it anymore. She had a purpose. She talked about going to college and starting her life over, away from her controlling husband. So in the early morning of April 1990, Delbert Ray Collins and his two friends were driving past a truck stop and they saw a blue high-heeled shoe in the road. They slowed down and saw it looked like a young woman lying face down in the gutter, and she was convulsing. So they called paramedics. They'd come and take her to Presbyterian Hospital in Oklahoma City. So this was Tanya. This was Tanya. She was unconscious, apparently a victim of a hit and run. They found a loaf of bread, two bottles of Dr. Pepper, and a bag of cookies in the road, along with a pair of headphones and a portable radio antenna, windshield wiper, and flecks of red paint. So the, the idea was, or the thought was, she had been listening to music on the headphones when a red car had struck her. Now, everybody at the truck stop was interviewed. Clerk at the mini-mart there said that a woman had come into the store and bought some groceries around 12.30, and it looked like she had been walking towards the Motel 6 when she was hit. So on the way to the hospitals, paramedics had tried to talk to her, but she was unresponsive. She had involuntary movement of her extremities, and she was moaning. She called out, Daddy, Daddy, several times. That's so sad. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. Scratches and faded bruises on her body, fresh bruises on the backs of her legs and buttocks, and a huge hematoma on her head. Doctors thought she'd been struck from behind, and the bumper had struck her legs. Force of the blow sent her rolling over the hood of the car and the windshield, and she hit the road behind the car. The back of her head had been severely injured. Now the next day, Clarence Hughes showed up at the hospital. He identified the victim as his 23-year-old wife, Tanya Hughes. Now Clarence was average size, wearing jeans and sneakers. He told the police that his wife and him and their two-year-old son had traveled to Oklahoma City from Tulsa so that Tanya could keep a gynecologist appointment. Right, but nobody would confirm that there ever was an appointment. Right. Yeah. So that was a lie. It was. So they checked into a Motel 6 the day before the alleged appointment, uh, checking in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Around midnight, Tanya decided to walk down to the convenience store for some groceries. So she called 15 minutes later from a payphone in the store to say she couldn't find any baby food and she would come home with milk and bread. Clarence said he fell asleep and he didn't learn of the accident until the next morning when the motel clerk told him a woman who fit his wife's description had been taken to the hospital. So that's when Clarence called the police and they met him at the Motel 6. Clarence told them that his wife was a professional stripper who danced at a club in Tulsa. He said she liked to meet men and he was used to her being gone most of the night. Police checked Clarence's car and it was a blue Oldsmobile. And it was on damage, so it didn't look like his car could have done the hit and run. When the police brought Clarence to Tanya's hospital room, they were struck by how blasé he was. She was in a coma and unresponsive to speech. Her brain had been severely bruised and she was being monitored. 
Clarence didn't touch his wife or try to comfort her. What he did was he asked the nurse for a pen, paper, and a piece of tape. Then he put a handwritten sign on Tanya's door that read, No Visitors, and he left the hospital. Tanya's friend Connie got a call at the strip club from Clarence, and he was calling because he wanted to come by and pick up her paycheck. After Connie prodded him, he told her that Tanya was in a coma from a car accident. Now, she didn't believe any of this. He said she was at Presbyterian Hospital, but no visitors were allowed. Well, Connie didn't like him, and she wasn't going to take his word for this. So she drove 120 miles to see Tanya. When she walked into the hospital room, Tanya was lying alone on the bed. She didn't have any scratches on her face and arms, which was strange. So Connie was confused. She didn't look like she'd been hit by a car. She didn't have scrapes or broken bones, just the leg bruises and the head injury. Connie sat at Tanya's bedside and held her hand. A nurse came in to take her vital signs and saw that Tanya was beginning to respond to her. Her head moved toward Connie and she squeezed her hand. Kevin was allowed in to visit once and he was really feeling sad and he showed more concern than Clarence had. Well, Kevin's the college guy in love with her. Right. And it looked like Tanya might recover at that point. Connie wasn't the only one who doubted Clarence's story about what happened. Doctors and nurses definitely had their doubts, too. It was strange that all of Tanya's clothing and her purse had been taken from the room. And then there was the no visitor sign on the door. When Connie told one of the doctors her concerns, he answered this was no accident. So a lot of suspicion regarding Clarence. Yes, because if you're hitting a hit and run, you'd have, like, scrapes from the road and stuff. Well, wouldn't you? But it was just the back of her legs and her head. So that's really odd. She did have other bruises and things, but they were older, like from abuse. Kevin had told Connie that morning about their plan to get away from Clarence. They couldn't understand why she'd changed her mind. She'd been making plans and talking about a future for the past month, and then this happened, so that seems like more than a coincidence. The medical staff told Connie she should go talk to the Oklahoma City Police about her concerns. So she stayed there in a nearby hotel. The nurses would call her after Clarence left so she could go visit. Connie was positive that Clarence had hurt Tanya. Somehow, though, Clarence found out about Connie's visits. He called her and screamed at her to leave. She didn't tell him that she'd spoken to the police, though. He told her he needed money, and then he offered to sell her everything in their trailer in Tulsa, because he's ready to take off again. He said he and Michael were moving to Oklahoma City now. Yeah, no mention of, of Tanya. No, he's pretty much done with her at this point. He yeah. thinks he's going to wash his hands of her. So Connie called the hospital in Oklahoma City and warned the staff to keep an eye on Tanya. She thought that Clarence had tried to kill her once, and she was thinking he would try again. Now, she had to go back to Tulsa, so she left the next day and left her home and work phone numbers with the nurses. Now, early the next day, Connie got a call from the hospital. Tanya's condition had suddenly gotten worse. Very suddenly. Uh, this, right. is, this is a suspicious thing in, of itself. Oh, absolutely. She's getting better, and then he visits that night, and she dies the next morning. Yeah. So Tanya's on life support and is not expected to survive the day. So Connie naturally is devastated and racked with guilt for having left her friend's side. When she got back to the hospital that afternoon, Tanya was gone. She had died with only the hospital staff at her side. Her husband, who had been called that morning, said he wouldn't be there. But he did leave orders for her organs to be donated and her body to be cremated. But what could he have done to her the night before that would make her die? Well, if he'd smothered her. There was no evidence of fresh trauma. No. And I don't know that he could have gotten his hands on any medication to give her. So I think if he just deprived her of air and she was already in fairly critical condition... Yeah, she couldn't defend herself. Right. But there's certainly some suspicion there, isn't there? Well, yeah, definitely. So her organs were donated. Her heart was given to a 66-year-old wife and mother in Arizona, and her liver went to a 39-year-old New York woman. One kidney went to a 24-year-old man, and the other one went to a 14-year-old in Oklahoma. Two blind people in Oklahoma were given her corneas. The staff of the uh, strip club in Tulsa, Passions, paid for her funeral. That tells me something about who she was as a person, that this Connie 
made all that effort, drove there, stayed there, and that her co-workers paid for the funeral. I mean, people loved her. They did. Yeah, so she was she, an incredible she, person. She touched a lot of people. She sure did. And then to have her organs help people like that, I mean, it really just kind of chokes you up a little bit. It's really amazing that this girl went through all this and actually contributed to the world anyway, despite everything. But it's, of course, very suspicious that he donated her organs and right. wanted her cremated. And had her cremated. Yeah, that's bad. But before she was cremated, her body was sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy because it was an unexplained death. Absolutely. So she had multiple older bruises over most of her body, fresh abrasions on her lower back and thighs. She had an old fracture of her right shin bone. She'd had several pregnancies and surgeries, including breast and buttock implants. Now her head had been severely damaged. Her brain was swollen and blood filled the dura. So that's a subdural hematoma, which we've talked about in another case. The severe impact to the back of her head had moved her brain forward, causing a large hematoma just above her neck. The probable cause of death was closed head injury as a result of a violent or unnatural death, and the manner of death was a homicide. So it could have been homicide by hit and run. Could have been. Or it could have been someone beat her with a bat or something, I guess. Could have been that. Clarence Hughes, he called the Department of Human Services on May 1st, and he asked for Michael to be put in temporary foster care for a week. So there's stuff going on. I don't know why he wouldn't just get a babysitter or a friend of Tanya's to watch the little boy. It's a weird decision to put a child in foster care for a week. It certainly is. And what he did was he emptied everything out of the Tulsa trailer, sold stuff off, and then Tanya was being buried on May 4th, and he told the state he'd pick up Michael on May 7th. Michael was taken 20 miles away to Choctaw, where he lived with a foster family. These foster parents, Ernest and Merle Bean, had been foster parents to more than 60 children over six years. Michael was the most emotionally distressed child they'd ever dealt with. Now that's saying something. Sure is, because you know kids in foster care usually come kind of damaged anyway. Right, and they'd had 60 of them, and he was the worst. Yep. Merle was a stay-at-home mom, which of course you'd have to be, and Ernest was self-employed as a heating and air conditioning technician. Michael was inconsolable. As soon as he got to the house, he fell to his knees in their foyer and started banging his head on the floor. I mean, for a while, these people were like, we don't think we can deal with him. And they're experienced. But, of course, they did end up bonding with him. Connie had returned to Oklahoma City on May 2nd. She went to talk to the police and the Department of Human Services. The police were aware of the autopsy report, but they couldn't say anything to Connie and she left them feeling like they were just ignoring her. When she went to the Department of Human Services office, she was told that Michael was already in foster care, that Clarence had placed him in foster care. When Clarence went back to get Michael, though, he was turned away. The Juvenile Bureau of the DA's office had filed an application stating that Michael was a deprived child and he should be made a ward of the court, not go back to Clarence. So this, they saw, is their first step in terminating his parental rights. At the funeral, Tanya had a closed casket surrounded by many flowers. Her friends and co-workers from Passions were there. She had no family at all, of course. Clarence arrived wearing dark sunglasses. His thinning hair was dyed burgundy and pulled back in a stringy ponytail so that the dye was still dripping down his neck. He had two Tulsa sheriff's deputies in suits with him, and he said they were his bodyguards. Now Clarence spoke at the service, which was bad. He told everyone they didn't really know his wife, and she had secrets that they would never know about, and that they should just let things be, he said. Now before he left the chapel, Clarence put a picture on top of Tanya's casket. This picture was of a little blonde-haired girl sitting on the lap of an older man. If one looked closely enough, they could see the resemblance between the photo and Clarence, but that meant that the older man standing before them, Clarence, had known his wife since she was a little girl. Now he didn't seem to find anything wrong with that. At the end of the service, the coffin was seized by police until the investigation into her death could be completed. Now Clarence called the insurance company that day. 
he had purchased $80,000 in insurance on Tanya's life just months earlier. He told the clerk he had no idea that he would be calling so soon, but a terrible tragedy had befallen his young wife. The clerk asked for a social security number and put him on hold. Yeah, now then he came back and said there was a problem, that social security number didn't exist. So Clarence apologized, saying he'd mixed up the numbers, gave them another number. But this was no good either. So he's making two. up numbers. So he apologizes again. He said he's just confused after burying his wife that very day. So he must have really wanted the money because he took a big risk. He gave him a real Social Security number. But this number was belonging to Franklin Delano Floyd. So big mistake here. Big time mistake. So get him caught, yeah. So when the clerk got back on the phone, there's a change in his tone, and he told Clarence that everything was in order. Right, but he could probably tell from his voice that... But Clarence or Franklin... Gig was up. He must have noticed the change in the clerk's voice. Yeah. So he packed his bags and took off. So when the clerk had looked up that number, he found out that Clarence was a federal fugitive who had been on the run since 1973 for parole violation and attempted kidnapping. So the insurance company notified the U.S. Marshal's office, and after talking to the Oklahoma City police, they knew that he was probably armed and dangerous. So they're trying to gather evidence to prove that he had killed his wife, Tanya. Meanwhile, Michael was with the Bean family, and he was making slow but steady progress. Kevin spoke with the police and told them he was planning to help Tanya leave Tulsa with her son. She had been afraid of her husband, and she had told Kevin about the abuse she was suffering. Yeah, but I don't think she told him that she'd been kidnapped as a child. No. No. That was still a secret. Yeah, all Kevin knew about Tanya was that her parents had been killed in a car accident when she was a child, and she had no other living relatives. She had known her husband all her life. He had lived down the street from where she grew up in Alabama. That was the story. That's the story. The Beans were notified that Clarence had taken off, and DHS was going forward to terminate his parental rights. Now, the Beans wanted to keep him in their care, even though he was a challenge. He wasn't potty trained, didn't speak, only grunting. When he had first arrived, he refused to drink milk and only wanted a bottle filled with half Pepsi, half water. Now he's drinking milk, and he loved peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, so there's our steady progress. But, you know, it has to be so rewarding to take a child like that and to make progress, because your heart it? has to go out to a kid like that. It's just such a heartbreaker. Yeah. So... I mean, they're doing, like, incredible things. Foster parents are amazing. So meanwhile, Connie and the owner of the Passions Club were trying to find any of Tanya's relatives. Yeah, they wanted them to be able maybe to take Michael and save him from this beast. Yeah. So they, they saw that Tanya's maiden name was Tadlock, and she was from Alabama. So they started making calls, and then they finally reached a woman who said she was Tanya Dawn Tadlock's mother. Now, Tanya had been dead for 20 years. She had died at 18 months. She had died at age 18 months of pneumonia. So right. there's, there's another alias right. that they had picked up. That he got them from, I guess, tombstones. Yeah. Yeah, graves. Franklin Delano Floyd was arrested in Augusta, Georgia, six weeks after leaving Oklahoma City. Now, at this point, he'd been living under another alias, Trenton B. Davis. Once he admitted who he was, he said he liked to be called Floyd. So Floyd was arraigned and taken to jail. He called his old friend David Dial, and he was transferred to the Federal Correctional Facility in Atlanta. From there, he contacted the Oklahoma Department of Human Services and told them he'd been arrested. He was going to serve his time and turn his life around. So he asked DHS to take care of Michael until his release and he'd be back for him. So this guy's got some big cojones to even think of this. Doesn't he? He's he got, going to come and get his son. Yeah. He got an attorney who argued in juvenile court that Floyd was actually a loving father who wrote to his son every week. He planned to take a parenting class in prison, and he wanted to regain custody of his son. And the court recognized Floyd as Michael's father and scheduled a review hearing. So this whole thing, to me, is just dumbfounding. Unbelievable. Yeah. The Beans couldn't believe it either. No, they didn't, because here this guy, Floyd, is a convicted felon and a pedophile. How could a pedophile be allowed around any child? Right. That's what gets me. Michael, at the same time, was uh, really distressed emotionally. Well, of course, he's been damaged by this man. He has been. 
So in December 1990, Floyd was transferred to a federal prison near Oklahoma City, and he was granted visitation with Michael. Is that crazy? To me it is. Me too. So he's delivered to a social worker for his visit in January of 91. Poor kid. His visit with Floyd was supervised by a social worker, and it lasted an hour. At a review hearing in February, Floyd agreed to complete parenting classes. The court also ordered that Michael should be circumcised at Floyd's request. What the hell? <laughs> Jesus. I know. And they also finally got around to ordering a paternity test, which to me is one of the early things I do. Yes, but now they're not going to even go through with the test for a year. So a year passes, and Michael has to continue making these monthly visits. But the court at that point finally notes that the paternity test had never been completed, and the judge finally orders that the paternity test be done. So Floyd's resisting doing the test, and it takes until July when it's finally done. And the results showed that he was not Michael's father. Uh -huh. Department of Human Services attorneys requested then that his parental rights be terminated. Floyd insisted that he was Michael's father, but the court terminated visitation and his parental rights. And that should have been the end of it, but it wasn't. So the Beans, they're filing to adopt Michael, things seem to be going in the right direction. But Floyd only serves 33 months and is released on parole again. With no charges against him for Tanya's death, he gets to collect the $80,000 in life insurance. He continued to fight for custody of Michael. In July 1993, the Oklahoma Supreme Court reversed the decision of the court to terminate his parental rights. The court ruled that his rights had been violated when the court refused to let him contest the paternity test. So visitation is restored again, and a date for the hearing is to be determined, so he's indefinitely having visits with this boy again, even though it's not his biological child and he's a pedophile and a hundred yeah. other things. I mean, it's just mind-boggling to me. The, the only thing I can think of is that he had raised him as his son. Well. But still. I know, right? I mean, there's, there's so many strikes against this guy. Absolutely. And the mother's dead, this poor kid. And then he has the nerve to charge Merle in earnest with child abuse against Michael. He's unbelievable. He is. So in the spring of 94, Michael was five years old, and he visited Floyd and was left alone with him for 20 minutes. So somebody fucked up there. Yep. Now that evening, Merle found a photo of Floyd hidden in Michael's sock. He had told Michael it was their secret. So Floyd got a steady job as an apartment maintenance man and a recommendation from his employer. He visited a clinical psychologist who tested him and determined that he was not a criminal character and not antisocial. Well, that must have been a really in-depth exam. Well, I think he was kind of good at fooling people, because he seemed to fool quite a few people. Yeah, well, the psychologist recommended that reunification of Michael and Mr. Floyd should be actively pursued. Yeah, this person should be in prison. Wow. I mean, did this person not have all the information? How did they come up with that? Again, it's, it's just beyond my scope of meaning. Yeah. Well, another victim of Floyd's was Carrie Box. She was a young woman in her mid-twenties who entered her apartment and found Floyd in her bedroom going through her drawers. He had her panties in one hand and a knife in his other hand. When he saw her, he ran toward her and knocked her to the floor. She was fighting with him and he was slashing at her. She had several deep cuts on her arms. Fortunately, Carrie's boyfriend showed up and held Floyd until the police arrived. So again, he's arrested and charged with aggravated assault. As a maintenance man, he had master keys to all the apartments, and he'd let himself into her apartment. I mean, how many apartments do you think he'd gone into before this happened? I know. A lot. Floyd's attorney was able to get him released to a halfway house on $7,000 bail. What the fuck? Can you believe it? Nope. Floyd it's... lost his job, of course, but he found another job as a painter. And he was actually allowed to leave the house in the morning and go to work, but he had to return at the end of each day. Now, he knew the assault charge was going to make it impossible for him to get custody of Michael, and this is when I think he made the decision that he was going to go ahead and kidnap the child. Yeah, because the, the chances at this point of him getting custody were pretty slim, maybe zero. But just the fact that he's in a halfway house, I mean, how oh. many strikes is he getting here? A lot. So Michael's now six years old and in first grade at Meridian Elementary School in Choctaw. 
which was about two miles from his home, with Marilyn Ernest Bean. He had made amazing progress since the day they took him in almost four years earlier. He is now as potty trained, the crying spells had stopped, and his speech was, if not great, at least pretty good. He was not legally adopted because the court was still dealing with petitions from Floyd that he be recognized as Michael's father. So the Beans continued to be worried that Floyd would try something with Michael. Early one morning, they woke up to their dog barking at something in the backyard. Ernest went out with the dog, and they found a campsite about 200 feet into the woods in back of their house. And that week, Merle thought she saw Floyd driving by in his pickup. On September 12, 1994, Floyd showed up at Meridian Elementary School in a wrinkled suit and a felt hat. He went into Principal James Davis's office, and there he told Davis that he was ready to die, and he wanted him to help him get his son. He had a gun. So the principal got Michael from his class, and the two men walked with him out to Floyd's pickup truck. Floyd had Davis drive to a field about a mile and a half away, and he handcuffed him with his arms around a tree. Davis was able to loosen the tape on his mouth and call for help and got found two hours later. So I'm not super happy with uh, what this principal did either. Well, he's at gunpoint. Yeah, but you're going to go get a child and hand over a child? I think it's better to scream and run or something than to... I don't think I'd do that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a difficult one. Yeah, but you know, once the kid leaves the school, well, yeah, it's deep I shit. Mean, the barn door is closed, as they right. say. But I can see if i got this kind of disheveled, lunatic-looking guy pointing a gun at me, saying he's ready to die. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm scared. But you're kind of turning this kid over to him, too. I don't know if that's something you should do either. I guess it's a tough position to be in. I would feel so much guilt if I were him. I'm sure he does. Yeah. Michael Hughes' kidnapping was classified as immediate, and the FBI came in to interview Principal Davis and Floyd's parole officer. An all-points bulletin was issued to police agencies. Consultations with FBI behaviorists and profilers came up with two possible scenarios. So either Michael's in immediate danger, or Floyd had a relationship with Michael and wouldn't hurt him right away. So they thought that Michael probably had a week to 10 days before he would become a liability to Floyd, and the chances of recovering the boy alive would diminish dramatically at that point. Everyone known to have interacted with Floyd was interviewed. Jim Ennis, a former Oklahoma school district employee who worked with Floyd in the 1970s, gave agents a colored wallet-sized photo of a man in a posed picture with a girl. So this is the picture that we were talking about earlier. Yes. On the casket, the man wore a suit and tie. Ennis had known him as Trenton Davis. Of course, it's Floyd. And Trenton Davis had said that the little blonde girl in the photo was his daughter, Suzanne. Ennis said Davis had given him the photo years ago when they worked together and that Floyd had been very proud of the picture. Just weeks ago, Floyd had come back. He was older and grayer, but he recognized him, and he asked for the photo back. But Ennis told him he didn't have it, that it had been lost years ago. So now he was able to give it to police. The girl in the photo is about five years old, and when compared to photos of Tanya Hughes, it's clear that this is the same girl. Now they knew that she too had been kidnapped by Floyd, first as his daughter, and then as his wife. The truck Floyd had stolen was found on October 22, 1994, in Dallas, Texas. Interviews with his friend Dial revealed that he had helped out Floyd several times while he was a fugitive. Notices were sent out across the country, and information began to come in about Floyd's timeline. Using the name Trenton Davis, he enrolled Suzanne Davis in public school in 1975. Charges of sexual abuse against his daughter were filed in 1978, and that's when they moved to Louisville in 1980 with the new identities of Warren and Sharon Marshall. Floyd worked as a painter, and they joined a Baptist church there. Sharon went to church every Sunday and did well in school, but after two years they left Louisville for Atlanta. But they kept the names Warren and Sharon Marshall, and Sharon enrolled in Northside High School. She didn't finish school that year, but transferred to Baldwin High School. Four months after that, she was enrolled in Riverdale High School, and then she transferred to Forest Park High School, where she remained until graduation in 1986. So we're getting some of the backstory filled in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
So the agents also got Floyd's phone records and found a guy named Greg Higgs. This is a person Floyd had made a call to in Phoenix just days after Sharon's death. Now agents learned that Higgs was Michael's biological father. He was 20 years old and working as a waiter at Marriott in 1986. When Sharon started working there as a hostess, Higgs was attracted to her. She told Higgs that she planned to study aerospace engineering at Arizona State. So they dated for several months, with Higgs thinking it was getting more serious. One day, Sharon came in, picked up her paycheck, and disappeared. Eight months later, she returned. They became a couple again. They were together almost every day until the fall of 1987. And then Sharon quit her job and disappeared again, and her again. But at least we've cleared up one little mystery, who the father of Michael was. Right. And that's kind of how her life was. She, As soon as she made any connections, then Warren, Floyd, whoever you want to call him, would haul up and move her again. So in 1990, after Sharon died, Floyd called Higgs and told him she had died in a car accident. He told Higgs about Michael and asked if Higgs would take him. Higgs said he would. As far as I know, he's never seen this kid, right? No, he hasn't. So he's a nice guy. Well, I think he really loved Sharon. I mean, most people did love her, anyone yeah. who had her in their life. Now, Floyd said he'd call back in a day or two to make arrangements, but he never did. No, he never heard from him again. So Floyd had followed some patterns in his life, and the FBI notified the State Department of Transportation offices in Oklahoma, Kentucky, Georgia, Arizona, and Florida to watch for driver's license applications under the names of Franklin Floyd, Trenton Davis, Clarence Hughes, or Warren Marshall. Yeah, or any combination of these, I guess. Right. They got a hit a couple weeks later when a man named Warren Marshall applied to renew his Florida license. Now, he's living in Louisville, Kentucky at the time. Uh-huh. So this is a, a nice little sting operation, kind of. Floyd is working as a salesman <laughs> at a used car lot, and he's expecting his Florida license to arrive by FedEx. They had an FBI agent impersonate a FedEx driver who handed Floyd a package outside in the parking lot where he was quickly surrounded by seven FBI agents with guns drawn. Now, these scenes are really cool. Yeah. A couple of years ago, I was at the bus station parked out front, and I saw one of these things go down. I came home and told you. Yeah. There was a guy standing outside the bus station having a cigarette, and then all of a sudden, there were like these three cars pulled up slowly, and all of a sudden, these six men came out and just surrounded him and had him on the ground. That's what they did with Floyd. Yeah, they really have these things planned out, and it's really cool to see it happen. Floyd claimed that Sharon's mother had been a prostitute, and he took the little girl to save her from growing up in a bad environment. But he wouldn't say what her name was. He said that Sharon was Michael's mother, though. Michael was born in Tampa in 1988, and Floyd denied ever having sex with Sharon. He said he'd gotten their aliases from tombstones. He denied taking Michael and wouldn't say anything about where Michael was. Well, I don't know how he can deny taking him. There are witnesses. He, he did it at gunpoint. Right. In front of people. Yes. But initially he denied it completely. Right. So Floyd said that after fleeing Oklahoma, he had moved to Kansas, then Dallas, then Atlanta, and then finally Louisville. So agents searched his apartment. They interviewed his neighbors. Everyone had seen Floyd alone since his arrival. No one had seen Michael. Then they found a bus ticket for September 13th, which was one way for one passenger. So apparently Michael had not traveled with Floyd to Louisville. Yeah, Floyd said he had become depressed and was in the psychiatric ward at Grady Memorial Hospital for a while. He had told the hospital staff that his wife and son had recently died, but he offered no details. But they do recall that he was emotionally distraught and he was kept under psychiatric observation for eight days. Floyd checked himself out of the hospital and headed to Louisville, where he called up some old contacts and borrowed money, so now he's ready to start a new life again. His neighbors recalled him acting very odd at times, and even his fellow employees at the used car lot, where he'd been working for only a couple days, said he was a really weird guy. Police learned that before checking himself into Grady Memorial Hospital, Floyd had been a suspect in a carjacking in Atlanta. A woman had placed an advertisement in the classified section of the newspaper, and a man matching his description called and made an appointment to check out the vehicle. When they met up for the test drive, the man assaulted the woman and took off with the car. Now this happened on the day before 
Floyd checked himself into the mental hospital. So the FBI is now pretty sure that poor Michael had been killed. Yeah, because anyone who had any contact with Floyd said that he had always been alone. Yeah. There was a week of Floyd's life before the hospital admission that is unaccounted for, and agents believe that Michael had been killed during that week, and Floyd had checked into the hospital after the killing. Yeah. And certainly after the attempted carjacking. Exactly. So days after he arrived in Louisville, Floyd had found a job as a painter with a small contractor. He displayed some odd behavior and didn't last long at that job, and he ended up selling used cars, at least for a couple of days. Yeah. Now the phone number of Rebecca Barr was found in Floyd's wallet. She was a friend of his from way back in the children's home, and she agreed to cooperate with the FBI to help find Michael. Rebecca called the prison and left a message for Floyd to call her, and then he called back Collect. He asked her if she'd heard anything or if she'd been contacted by the FBI, and she told him she wouldn't say anything to hurt him. So he began calling and talking to her often. But the conversations really went nowhere, and she and the FBI really believed that Michael was dead, that he hadn't, you know, stored him with anybody anywhere. Now, despite all this evidence against him, Floyd had the legal argument that he was within his legal and parental rights as Michael's father to take him from the school. Floyd presented himself to the court as Michael's father for two years as he cared for and supported him. He was charged with kidnapping, interstate transportation of a stolen vehicle, and possession of a firearm during a kidnapping and carjacking. But if he successfully argued that he was Michael's father, the kidnapping charge, which was the most serious charge, could be dropped. Well, yeah, but he's got all those other charges, and he is a convicted felon. I know, but he just seems to be uh, able to get out on yeah. a lot of things. I mean, he was a pedophile years and years ago and escaped prison, and he's still been freed several times. Yeah, he's the Teflon guy, right? Yeah, I know. So the files on Floyd had given FBI agents the opinion that Michael was dead. They needed to find his remains and determine a cause of death, but that was proving difficult. Floyd had told one cellmate that he had thrown Michael off a bridge. Floyd even added that he could hear the little bastard's screams as he fell to the river below. Disgusting. Then another witness said that Floyd admitted he killed Michael and put him in a drain pipe that was being prepared for the 1996 Olympic Games. Then the most disturbing story was from Floyd's sister, Dorothy. She called police to tell them that her brother had confessed to killing Michael told her that Michael was crying all the time about wanting to go home. And you know, I bet he was. I'm sure he it's was. Horrific. So Floyd was giving Michael a bath in a motel room, and he got into the tub with the boy. He asked Michael if he loved him, and Michael said no. Floyd got angry and drowned him in the tub. He didn't tell his sister where he'd gotten rid of the child's body. No, but she really thought that this is probably what actually happened. Yeah. It seemed real to her. She was quite upset. In January 1995, a federal grand jury returned a seven-count indictment against Franklin Floyd. There was no murder charge, though. Investigators contacted Jennifer Fisher to find out more about who Sharon was. Jennifer was married with her own child when she learned of Sharon's death. She was disturbed to learn that her friend had gone through all these horrible things that she hadn't been able to share with her. Now, if she told her family what she was going through, she felt sure that they would have taken her in and protected her. So she just couldn't understand why she hadn't said anything about it. Yeah, you know, she kept that hidden from her friend. Mm -hmm. She flew from California to Oklahoma City to talk to the FBI. They were surprised to hear that Sharon had been on the honor roll and had received scholarships because they were thinking she was just this prostitute. Yeah. Jennifer was really shocked to hear that her beautiful, intelligent friend had worked as a stripper and a prostitute. Now, around this time, a mechanic at a garage in Mission, Kansas, had purchased the pickup truck that Floyd had stolen from the principal when he kidnapped Michael. And this guy was going to do some work on the truck, and he rolled himself under the rear end of it. And there he found a manila envelope wrapped in masking tape that was taped to the gas tank. So he removed it, and he's thinking it's probably drugs, but it was actually worse than that. It was photographs and he ended up taking them to the police. There were 97 in all, mostly of young girls, nude and involved in sexual activity. There were four groups of photos. The first group was on a boat. The second was two girls between 10 and 12 years old, dressed in provocative clothing. 
The third group of photos was one blonde girl as she grew up from toddler to teenager, and she was posed in sexually explicit positions. That girl would be identified as Sharon or Suzanne Savakis. The fourth set of photos was a young woman in her teens or early 20s. She was blindfolded and had been beaten. She was positioned on her back, and you could tell that she was unconscious. Agents actually believed that she was dead. The photos of Sharon told the story of her life as a captive, who was abused and then killed, and then her son was killed. Floyd requested a bench trial, so there was no jury. He also decided to act as his own attorney. He said he'd studied law while he was in prison. The judge appointed Susan Otto from the public defender's office to be his co-counsel because his knowledge really was not extensive. Now, he was found guilty of all the charges, including the kidnapping. The FBI was able to match the photos of the blindfolded woman to a Jane Doe case from one year earlier. This woman's remains had been found off the side of a highway in Florida. The victim was a white female between 18 and 20 years old. She'd been badly beaten, and she had multiple fractures to her face. There were two gunshot holes in the back of her skull. The white bikini top and striped shirt found near the body looked like the clothes of the girl in the photo. Floyd had lived in the Tampa area from 1988 to 1989 under the alias Warren Marshall. After looking through missing persons reports, they came upon the file of Cheryl Ann Camesso, a 19-year-old who was reported missing in June 1989, but she hadn't been seen since April. Her red Corvette was abandoned at the airport in May. Her height and weight matched the remains of this Jane Doe, and she also had breast implants like the woman in the photo. They compared the torture photos to Cheryl's driver's license, and they did look very similar. It would take dental records to identify Jane Doe as Cheryl Camesso, and then her family was notified, and police learned a lot about her life. Now, Cheryl had dropped out of high school when she was just 16 and began working as an exotic dancer. Prior to her disappearance, Cheryl had danced at Mons Venus near downtown Tampa. Agents went ahead and visited that club, and they brought with them photos of Floyd and Sharon. People who'd been there back in the 80s recognized both of them, so Sharon and Cheryl had been dancers there together. So we have that connection. Yes. So Cheryl performed under the name of Stevie. She needed a place to stay and moved in temporarily with Sharon and Warren. Now, Cheryl liked Warren. He told her that he had contacts in the entertainment industry. So Cheryl agreed to appear in a video, and Warren took footage of Sharon and Cheryl posing and performing sex acts on the beach. He talked Cheryl into posing nude, telling her that he was a photographer with connections at Playboy. So when Warren tried to get her to have sex with him, she punched him. Warren flew into a rage and tried to choke her. They were on a boat, and he came toward her with a fishing net. But she was afraid for her life. She jumped off the boat swam a quarter of a mile to shore and hitchhiked home. Well, you know, it's just a good thing they weren't further out. No kidding. But Cheryl had decided to get back at Warren at that point, and she called the Department of Human Services and reported that Sharon was earning over $1,500 a week dancing because she was still collecting welfare checks. And Warren was furious when he found out. Well, sure. Now he made an attempt to abduct Cheryl in the parking lot of the club, but that time she screamed and a bouncer came out and saved her. However, just one week later, Cheryl Ann Camesso went missing and wasn't seen again. Before fleeing Florida, Floyd got in trouble for insurance fraud for intentionally sinking his boat and trying to collect the insurance money. He took off with Sharon and Michael, who was just an infant then, and headed off to New Orleans. Now that's where they got married under the names of Clarence Hughes and Tanya Tadlock and then they moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma under those names. A grand jury was impaneled in Florida to consider these allegations that Floyd had beat and killed Cheryl Camesso back in the 80s in his rented trailer home. The photos found in the stolen truck, or taped to the underneath of the stolen truck, revealed that Cheryl was either dead or near death, and then he had shot her twice in the head and disposed of her body on the side of I-275. Then he left her car at the airport where it was found. So he was indicted for first-degree murder for the death of Cheryl Camesso. But at this point, Rebecca Barr, who he'd known since he was a kid, wasn't cooperating with the police to help find Michael anymore. 
she said she'd fallen in love with Floyd and they planned to get married while he was in prison. True love. So that's just a weird side story, I guess. Isn't it? Yeah. So one of the pictures of Cheryl Camesso contained an image of someone else's thumb. Now, this thumb was found by FBI analysis to contain multiple similarities to Floyd's thumb. And then many of the pictures contain images of furniture, a boat, and areas of a trailer, all of which belonged to Floyd. So the trial lasted only nine days. Floyd was convicted and sentenced to death in Pinellas County, Florida, in November of 2002. Floyd continued to insist Michael was alive, that he had put the boy somewhere safe after leaving the school principal handcuffed to a tree back on September 12, 1994. Floyd would defend what he did, saying Michael was his son, despite what a blood test showed. Police were able to get some details from Floyd in a conversation and were able to track down Sandra Chapman, whose four children had been taken from her back in 1975 when she'd had that jail sentence for writing a bad check. So she was able to find those two children, Allison and Amy Brandenburg, just a few days later, but the oldest daughter, Suzanne, and her little one-year-old son, Philip, were never recovered. Using DNA testing, they were able to confirm a link between Sandra and the woman who called herself multiple names. So, Tanya, Suzanne, Sharon. Sharon. Yeah. yeah. Her real name was Suzanne Marie Savakis. Her infant brother, Philip Brandenburg, was just a year old at the time, and he's never been identified or found. Police believe that Floyd probably killed that boy way back in 75, was it? Yeah, way back yeah, in 75 okay, yeah. when he was just a baby. I don't know why he kept that boy and killed him, but I don't know why he did a lot of the things he did. From death row in Florida in September of 2014, Floyd admitted to two FBI agents from Oklahoma that he had killed Michael the very same day of his abduction. It had become clear to him that his plan to raise the boy while being a fugitive from the law just wasn't going to work. So this is how much regard he has for human life. It's not working out, so I'll just kill a child. Yep, might as well. So Floyd told the two agents uh, that he had shot and buried Michael at the last Oklahoma exit before the Texas border on Interstate 35. There was a two-day search of the area in March 2015, but nothing was found. Yeah, so he hasn't been recovered. But Floyd also admitted to the two FBI agents from Oklahoma the true identity of Michael's mother. In an interview in May of 2014, he admitted she was Suzanne Savakis, the oldest of the three daughters of Sandra Chapman. And he revealed that he took off with Suzanne in 1975. They first moved to Oklahoma City. He said he dropped the other girls at a children's home, but he never did say what happened to little Philip Brandenburg. The FBI confirmed his account of Suzanne's life through marriage records and DNA samples. Floyd, though, refused to talk to FBI agents about her death. So there are still some things he hasn't revealed. Quite a few. Yeah. And he's still on death row. He's 73 years old. So we'd be remiss if we didn't say that a huge chunk of the information we got for this podcast was from a great book by Matt Birkbeck called A Beautiful Child. He did extensive research and he's literally wrote the book on this story. We have some other resources too, which I'll include in our show notes. But if you really want to learn more about this fascinating case, we would definitely recommend Birkbeck's book. Yeah, it's a good book to read, a readable book. Yeah, I mean, it reads like a novel, which yeah. is always good. It makes it easier to read true crime when it's kind of written in a, in a story like that. And you'll get an even better idea of what a monster Floyd is. Unbelievable, right? Yeah. But then I always feel like a lot of people failed to catch things, too. That drives me crazy. There were opportunities missed. Yeah. All right, let me do a little plug for Ty Grabber Podcasts, and then we'll get to feedback. Okay. I'd like to remind our listeners that if you're a Ty Grabber member, you can get members-only podcast episodes to listen to. It's the primary support for our podcast, and we prefer to get support by adding members to Ty Grabber instead of piling on the commercials. We've kind of cut back on that a little bit. Our members receive a TCB gift from us, and they also get our undying admiration. So that's something to think about. If you're interested, just sign up at tygrabber.com, or you can support us on Patreon, and you can hear the premium episodes there as a patron. You can also support us by making a purchase through our Shop the Brewery page on our website. 
and it's always super helpful if you can give us a positive review on iTunes or wherever you listen to our podcasts. Our Design a True Crime Brewery t-shirt contest is still on for another three weeks, so please get your entry into us at truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com or through a direct message on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. We welcome your feedback, too, and would really like to hear from our listeners about your experiences or your views on crime and punishment, especially in the U.S., but also around the world. For example, are we doing enough to prevent crime, and are we dealing with criminals in a constructive way? Is justice just a way for us to punish a killer, or is it more? Like a way to keep someone off the streets, or should we be trying to rehabilitate people more? Maybe you believe that prison just makes violent offenders worse. These are some of the issues that fascinate me and some of the reasons I was driven to start this true crime show. So any experiences or opinions you have on that, I'd love to hear. If you don't want to write in and have your opinions discussed on a future episode, you can also share your opinions and suggestions and experiences on our True Crime Brewery fan discussions page on Facebook. We have really amazing listeners who are there and have great stuff to share. There's a lot of back and forth on there that I enjoy when I get a chance to go on there. So, Dick, I'm ready. Let's get right into feedback. Okay, let's do it. I have a case suggestion from Go Ahead, Make My Day. Dirty Harry. That's right. All right. Old Clint. Dick and Jill, I love, love, love your show. I found you all by searching on YouTube for the Deborah Farrar case and have been a fan ever since. Your show feeds two of my guilty vices, true crime mysteries and beer. You two have a great chemistry, and I love listening to your insights. Please consider doing a show on the Maria Marshall case. She was a New Jersey socialite mom to three boys who was murdered by her husband, Robert O. Marshall. Joe McGinnis wrote a book on this case, Blind Faith, Keep Up the Good Work, Cheers. We may have had this recommendation before. I think it sounds familiar, particularly the book reference. Yeah. So, Robert Oakley Marshall I found in Wikipedia. He was an American businessman who in 1984 was charged with and convicted later of contract killing of his wife Maria. The case attracted the attention of true crime author Joe McGinnis, whose best-selling book on the Marshall case, Blind Faith, was published in 1989. The book was adapted into an Emmy-nominated 1990 TV miniseries of the same name. So in 2002, Marshall wrote the book Tunnel Vision, Trial and Error, in which he challenged the conclusions that McGinnis drew in blind faith. So while pointing out flaws in the judicial process he believed failed him, he alleged that his trial was contaminated by police misconduct and compromised testimony and evidence. So he was originally sentenced to the death penalty, but he was resentenced to life in prison, and he had eligibility for parole in 2014. So he's still in prison, but he could get out. So that's interesting. He was an insurance broker and chairman of the Ocean County chapter of the United Way Fund. And he hired someone to kill his wife. Interesting. Yeah, so I think that might be one we do. It's been recommended more than once, I guess. So I won't keep bringing it up in feedback, but it does sound interesting. Okay. Okay. So I've got one. Well, I've got two, but we'll take turns. Okay. Uh, i got two from Julie King. Case recommendations? Case recommendations. So I'll do one, then you can do something else, and then I'll do the other one that Julie recommends. Okay. So she says, Happy New Year. I'll start it off by begging again for the stories of Blanche Taylor Moore and Marie Hilly, two of my fave, crazy bitches ever. I think they killed 11 or 12 of their family members in total. Wow. Now, Blanche Taylor Moore is a woman who was convicted of killing her boyfriend by slipping arsenic into his food. Not a pleasant way to go. No. And she's also suspected of killing three other people in the same manner and nearly killing another in the same way. A poisoner. A poisoner. And she's convicted of killing the husband with arsenic and killing three others the same way, but she hasn't been convicted of that yet. So that sounds interesting. It does. Put her in the possibility pile. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I have another suggestion from Teddy G. I'd like to hear you do an episode on Lawrence Singleton. In 1978, he picked up 15-year-old Mary Vincent, who was hitchhiking in California. He raped her, then cut her arms off below the elbows with an axe and threw her over an embankment, leaving her for dead. Naked and badly injured, she managed to climb up the 30 feet to the state highway. 
The first car... With her arms trapped up. Yeah. God. The first car whose driver spotted her sped up and drove away. Bastards. The second car, driven by a honeymooning couple who'd missed an exit, picked her up and drove her to the hospital. The story of Singleton's eventual arrest, trial, and incarceration are horrific. He steadfastly denied the crime, but after Mary's testimony, so she survived, whispered something to her as she left the stand. Next time I'll finish the job, he said. He only served eight of the 14 years he was given, and no community would allow him to live there. He ended up in a trailer on the grounds of San Quentin. Eventually, he moved to Florida, still protesting his innocence. He was arrested later for killing a prostitute and was sentenced to death. He died of cancer before he was put to death. Wow. Good suggestion, Teddy. That does sound good. To survive. Wow. That's a strong woman. I guess. You chop arms off below the elbow, you're going to bleed like crazy. I know, right? And she managed to climb 30 feet up? Yeah. Wow. Just good clotting, I guess. Amazing. Okay. So another suggestion from Julie King is Audrey Marie Hilly, who uh, was married to a guy named Frank Hilly, and they had two children, Mike and Carol, and they had a tough married life. They spent more money than they earned. It seems that Audrey, Audrey Marie got the additional money by sleeping with her bosses, so prostituting herself. She apparently was poisoning her family with a heavy metal, the son was hospitalized for symptoms that persisted until he went off to college. Then they disappeared. The husband died, and it looked like he had a hepatitis. The daughter, I guess, did not die, but was hospitalized and suspected of heavy metal poisoning, and this was found to be the case. And so she was tried and convicted of murdering her husband. Yeah, did the daughter testify against her? Because that sounds familiar. I believe so, because it's a movie was made in 1991 oh. called Wife, Mother, Murderer, <laughs> starring Judith Light as oh. Audrey Hilly. Interesting. Uh, and Whip Hubley and David Ogden Steers were in it. So that's, <laughs> I, I like poisoning, so those are always interesting. They do make interesting cases, and I like the made-for-TV movies, I must say. Yeah, so we'll look at that. Okay, so MS Fix 66 has a case suggestion. I'll mention Joy Allure again as a good one for you too. The movie is on YouTube, and there is an episode of Dominic Dunn called Deception in Dallas. The movie is called Telling Secrets with Sybil Shepherd as Joy. There was an ID show about the case too, and I think it was scorned but not certain. It is a crazy case. I also recommend T. Cullen Davis. So Joy Allure... On a fall afternoon in 1983 in an upscale Dallas suburb, Roseanne Galunas was found stripped, bound to her bed, and shot through her skull. Her four-year-old son had been napping peacefully in the next room when she was killed. Roseanne's husband, Dr. Peter Galunas, and her lover, Larry Allure, immediately fell under suspicion. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you got a husband and a lover. Yeah until a surprise informant identified the mastermind behind the murder as Allure's own wife, Joy, a woman so driven by jealousy and greed that she put out a contract on both Roseanne and later her own husband. On the run and managing to elude investigators for eight years, the two-year search for the socialite would eventually end in the south of France. Their authorities found the elusive femme fatale, living as comfortably among the world's elite as she was among hired killers. At last, the authorities' questions would be answered to reveal a shocking insight into the heart of an unlikely killer in a small-town Texas crime that made international headlines. Uh-huh. That sounds like a good one. It does. And then T. Cullen Davis, she says, shows how the wealthy can get away with murder, even when caught red-handed by the FBI. So Thomas Cullen Davis is an American oil heir and member of the prominent oil family. He was best known for standing trial and being acquitted twice in the 1970s, first for the murders of two people at the home of his estranged wife Priscilla, and the second two years later for conspiring to murder the judge in his divorce proceedings against Priscilla. At the time of his first trial, Davis was the wealthiest man to have stood trial for murder in the U.S. The prosecution alleged in his murder trial that he forced his 12-year-old stepdaughter, Andrea Wilborn, into the basement of the mansion, making her kneel before shooting her dead and also shot Priscilla's live-in boyfriend. 
We've heard of this. I think there was a 2020 or something. I think so. Murder in the Mansion, it was yeah. called, or something. Well, and the, the name sounds familiar. Yeah. So this is kind of an older one, but it looks interesting. Yeah. I'm going to save that. Let's do that. Okay. I have a beer suggestion. Oh, good. This is from Fluffers 626. <laughs> and I think it relates to uh, one of our recent podcasts, because we talked about evil twin... Mexican biscotti cake break. Oh, God, yeah. That you gushed Delicious, over. yes. So, Fluffers626 says, OMG, Westbrook <laughs> is one of the best breweries, and Evil Twin loves to do collabs with them. Even though I now live in one of the craft beer capitals, Colorado, he's yeah. certainly correct there, <laughs> it is still my favorite brewery. I recommend their Ghosts and their Rye IPA called One Claw. I've had the Ghosts. It's quite nice. I really liked it. I enjoy a good Ghosts. And right, one claw I've been looking for, maybe one of these days I'll snag it up here in Maine, otherwise I might have to go to, down south. But they make a, a two claw also. What's the difference? Well, the, the rye IPA is one claw, and I think it just the two claw is just a non-rye, the regular IPA. Oh, I thought two claw might be a double IPA. Maybe two, it is, but maybe. it's not a rye. Okay. But, yeah, I'd like to do that. Have I, we done a I ghost agree. before? You must have, because you've done, like, 200 beers. I think we've done one. Yeah. Not very often, though, that we do a ghost. No. Nope. But don't a lot of those come from overseas? Is that a common one for the U.S. to make? It's getting more common. Oh, okay. It's gaining in popularity. Who makes Germ ghosts? German. German. But it's it's a nice summer beer. They, they tend to be crisp and refreshing and salty. Sometimes they're too salty for me. But they're nice beers. Yeah. Okay, I have a comment from Penny Sillen on An Officer and a Psychopath. That's the case on uh, Colonel Russell Williams, who was a serial killer and rapist. Mm -hmm. Regarding the widely held impression that United States justice would not have included possibility of parole for such a murdering sexual sadist and stone-cold psychopath like Russell Williams, had Williams raped and murdered in the U.S., he would have been prosecuted by the state under state laws which, of course, vary from state to state. There is no parole in federal prosecution, ever. Only way to get federal prosecution for murderers like Williams is if he'd crossed state lines with a victim. Many U.S. murderers not only have been sentenced with option of parole, but actually have been paroled, in some cases more than once, and have gone on to murder again and again. Historical cases of parole-eligible murderers include Manson family women, although they were denied such parole for decades until just this year. Kenneth Allen Duff kidnapped and killed women, but was paroled only to murder again. More recent cases of paroled murderers include serial killer Vernon Tatum, who raped and murdered elderly women, was paroled after serving 13 years, and went right back to the same Kansas neighborhood to kill again. The major difference between Canadian and American justice is that Canada has universally banned the death penalty where America has not. But the U.S. state-based system still offers and grants parole to proven serial killers slash sexual psychopaths, just like Canada. So I thought this letter made some really good points. So I went online to find examples of some violent convicts who were released only to kill again. So to me, this is important because we can go over crimes as entertainment, but... It's a little more substantial and constructive if we can take a look at criminal justice systems once in a while and just examine the different aspects like punishment, recidivism, stuff like that. So I found a list on a website called Monsters and Critics written by John Ray, and these are murderers who killed after being freed. So John Lawrence Miller, in 1957, at the age of 15, he left a family dinner, broke into a nearby home, and beat a 22-month-old girl to death. So he reported he wanted to know how it felt. So he's 71 years old and incarcerated, but just two short months after he was paroled, I guess he was in prison for 17 years, paroled, and two months later, he shot and killed both of his parents. Now he is at the prison. He's 71. John Rodney McRae, considered a serial killer with a preference for little boys, he was only 16 when he slashed the throat and genitals of an 8-year-old boy Joey Housey in 1950. So he was convicted of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life. William Milliken, governor of Michigan, commuted his sentence in 1972 and he was paroled. He got married, he had a son, became a prison guard in the state of Florida, 
And then over the next several years, he tortured and murdered four more boys. And one more that I thought was significant was Corey R. Barton. In 1983, Corey Barton beat and stabbed Sherry Ann Merton to death. He accepted a plea bargain that reduced the charge to manslaughter, and he got an 18-year sentence. Then when he was released after only nine and a half years, he struck again, and he killed his ex-girlfriend and the mother of his four-year-old son. So the family consented to a second-degree murder charge, and he was acquitted due to circumstantial evidence. So the point here is there are many people in the U.S. that are convicted, get out, and murder again. Yeah, and I, I guess the thing that you're trying to figure out is how can you predict who those are going to be? Right. You can't. But you can can't. You? No. Right? So is it better to just keep everyone in for life? <laughs> I'm not answering that. Yeah, I don't know. It's tough. We don't know. I just think it's an interesting thing to think about. Well, it is. That's I why mean, I'd like to get people's opinions on it. I mean, at least if, if I think about pedophiles, I don't think there's any treatment at all for them. So I'd be reluctant or, or leery about letting them out. Yes, me too. But I can't speak to murderers. Well, it's a big risk, isn't it? it seems to be. Yeah. I mean, this was just a small sampling. You got 10. Yeah, well, there's many more, too. That was just a sample. I know. Happens yeah. all the time, really. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So. Yeah, so we really haven't figured out how to take care of crime at all. No, we haven't. No, long way to go. Uh-huh. All right, this is a long podcast. Let's wrap it up. Wrap it up. Let's go finish this and uh, edit it and get it out. Okay. All and right. we'll hit the quiet end. That's right. We'll see you next time at the quiet end. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.